Live from our hurricane headquarters with real-time analysis from some of the nation's top meteorologists, this is Tracking the Tropics, powered by Bose Electric. Welcome in to the very first episode of the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season, Tracking the Tropics. I am your host, meteorologist Amanda Holly, and uh, we have a full episode for you today and a full season ahead for sure. If you've never joined us on Tracking the Tropics, it is a very interactive program where we answer your questions live in real time. We have a panel of meteorologists joining us each and every single week. We are live at, on Tuesdays at 1230 Eastern time every single Tuesday, whether there is a storm out there or not, and even more when there are storms out there. So welcome into this very first episode. I want to bring in my panel of meteorologists joining me. Of course, WFLA meteorologist Rebecca Berry here at WFLA. We are kind of the two meteorologists that you'll see pretty consistently week to week. And then we also bring in featured meteorologists, guest meteorologists from around the country every single week to kind of pick everyone's brain a little bit. Everybody brings something different to the table, but this should be a familiar face to you. Chief meteorologist from WKRG, Ed Bloodsworth. He uh, has been joining us since season one began six years ago. Uh, so thank you so much for being our first featured meteorologist of the year, Ed. Always happy to be with you guys each and every season. And of course, Rebecca, we are here each and every week as well. We're beginning season six, 2024 Atlantic hurricane season expected to be a very active one. I think that message has gotten across to the public very well at this point. But today we're talking about why it is such a so slow start to the season when it is expected to be a very busy one. Exactly. When you heard all of those predictions come out that it was going to be unprecedented between the, the sea surface temperatures and the overall weather pattern switching between El Nino and La Nina, you just kind of expected to have a preseason storm. I think I did. Yes, I, I really did too. I mean, I, I think it's 17 of the last 20 years we've had a preseason storm, whether that was a January storm uh, or, you know, a May, you know, a couple of May storms. It's been very active before that official June 1st start date. So, yeah, we're just kind of jumping right into things. If you've never seen Tracking the Tropics, it's really cool because us meteorologists, we get to nerd out about some of the stuff that we don't necessarily get to talk about, you know, in two minutes on TV. So that's the really the great part because it is interactive. You can stop us. You can ask us questions. If you want to uh, ask us questions, you can use the hashtags, hashtag Hey Amanda in the comment section, hashtag Hey Rebecca, and hashtag Hey Ed. And that lets us know that we can put your comment on screen and then we can answer it. But again, we get, we get pretty nerdy on this show, which is why we love it because we can go a little more in depth of, of why, of what is going on out there in the tropics. Right now, you're looking at a satellite map that says tracking the tropics, with nothing else on it because nothing else is out there. But uh, we do want to talk a little bit about what Tracking the Tropics is. Again, it is a weekly stream. This year, we are doing Tuesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time on whatever platform that you are watching now. We are on our app. We are on our Facebook page, specifically the WFLA app and Facebook page. Uh, this will also re-air on YouTube uh, and, and the podcast streaming services as well. But we're also live for important updates and especially those landfalling storms as well. But what we do is we bring the network of hurricane experts. That's what I was talking about, those featured meteorologists. We break down the science behind the forecast when we have a storm going on. And uh, again, Ed lives in Mobile, Alabama, so he's also in the Gulf Coast states. But we also bring in meteorologists from around the country because, uh, well, we all, we all studied those uh, tropical storms and tropical cyclones during our uh, schooling. So we all have an idea and definitely bring something different to the table. Ed, tell me what your favorite part about tracking the tropics is, is because you know you, you started with us with season one of course back here at wfla and you keep coming back for more well i remember like when we started this thing out it really was just it, it was as you said an opportunity for folks to kind of nerd out to get beyond just the two to three minutes that we have in a daily weather cast and to really break down you know our our, our impressions of these thunder of these storms as they form out there and I, I really like the fact that we get the opportunity for folks to ask us questions because again that's something we don't normally get to do during our newscast in the middle of a newscast you get folks to ask ask any questions and 
again, we get to really break down the science. I tend to think people are a little bit more weather savvy now than I think a lot of uh, folks to, uh, in our industry give uh, give folks credit for, just with so much information. But the, I, the other thing I love about this, it's a good opportunity for us to kind of make our way through all the noise out there and really get down to uh, what's the what are the most important things for folks to take away when it comes to tropical storms and hurricanes in the Atlantic. Absolutely. I, I you know, we've always talked about we're here tracking the tropics. That's what we do. So we're going to track whatever's out there. We're going to track even if it's just an area of some tropical moisture that's, you know, merging together that might be getting some buzz on social media. We're here to answer those questions, whether it becomes something or not. We're not here to hype, but we are just here to kind of break everything down, break the science down. So it is an exciting program. Uh, and again, we are live week to week. If you have a topic that you'd like us to cover over the the next six months, yes, believe it or not, we have six months of hurricane season ahead of us, uh, then please leave that in the comment section as well. We'll keep an eye on it because when it is quiet, like a week today, when we don't have a storm to track or a forecast model to discuss uh, or, you know, to talk about the European versus the GFS, we talk about something specific. We talk about, a, you know, a deeper topic that uh, might get asked as a question. Uh, sometimes the, we delve deeper into the less talked about aspects, sometimes more common complex aspects of hurricane forecasting and uh, we break it down for you so that you at home can understand it because I completely agree Ed that you know everybody can get the forecast on their phone now everybody can see that you know the National Hurricane Center's forecast cone it's very easily accessible which is fantastic but a lot of times uh, the forecast needs a little bit more explaining. So that is what we do here on Tracking the Tropics. And I'm excited for uh, the next six months. Hopefully that, you know, maybe all the storms will stay out in the Atlantic. Unfortunately, I don't necessarily think, though, that is uh, what is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to think that that chance is looking a little less likely this year, considering, as you guys have mentioned, all the uh, uh, preseason forecasts talking about this being um, an, excep an exceptionally active year. And I believe the folks at Colorado State, when they released their April forecast, used the words extremely active um, across the Atlantic. But um, but that's what you like to see right there with no development over the next seven days. The longer we can keep that in place, uh, the happier we will be. And I know we're going to dive into a couple of the issues why this is such a slow start. I mean, most people think expected to be a little bit slower to start the season, but there are a couple of uh, big factors at play this year. Yeah, some of which do not include Saharan dust, which we're going to talk about as well, uh, but kind of crazy because Saharan dust has been in the news, you know, at least for the first couple months of the season over the past several years, but we're not seeing a ton of it right now. Wanted to briefly give you a quick overview, though, Rebecca, of our 2024 hurricane names. Again, these names do get reused from year to year. Uh, I believe they're repeated every their six lists of names, so they get repeated every seven years. Uh, so the first name on our list this year is Alberto. Yes, and if storms are particularly deadly or damaging, they do retire the names and they replace them. And it gets harder and harder to do that because the, the names uh, alternate between male and female. They're also looking at more uh, inclusion in terms of names that are not just necessarily uh, a certain race or a certain from a certain country. And of course, the I names are getting really difficult because that's the most retired name. That time of the season uh, when we hit the I storms is really active. And so I think we might end up starting to see some really wild I names as we move forward over the next couple of years. They're going to have to get creative. I The I name this year, of course, being Isaac. So we will watch that one closely. Uh, but we have a lot of names to get through before <laughs> that uh, I name name, of course, right? So, uh, you know, I, I do anticipate us going through quite a few of these names, but uh, the official pronunciation for a couple of these, we were looking at it earlier. Luckily, there's not a ton of hard, hard to pronounce names this year. We've got Alberto, it is Alberto, and then we have Beryl, Chris, Debbie, Ernesto, Francine, Gordon, and it is Helene. And then I think the rest are pretty self-explanatory there. It's not an Isaias year. It is not yes. an Isaias <laughs> year. Also, I actually had someone uh, last week, uh, actually just in the grocery store, we were just talking about this and asked me, where, where do they come up with, with all yeah. these names? Like, if you do a deep dive into the history of naming tropical systems, it's, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, uh, they started going, they started introducing male names back in 1979. And then, of course, last year was the first year, and I, I think since 20, correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe it's since 2014, I believe, since that we did not retire a name off the list. 
Um, I, I know that that was just kind of an a bit unusual. I know a lot of folks were watching Adalia, another I name that we remember last year. But yeah, thankfully, no complicated names. But again, a good reminder to folks, too, that if this you know hyperactive season does come to fruition, it's it's possible that we could make it through the list of names. And nice reminder to folks that we no longer use the Greek alphabet anymore. That's right. They have a an alternative list of names now uh, that is a set list that they will, you know, break out. I don't have that graphic ready for you. Yeah. We'll certainly uh, introduce it at some point over the course of the season. Uh, and I, I agree, Ed, you know, there's a there's a high likability that we will get to that alternative names list. So they're regular names. Um, they're not the Greek alphabet uh, letters anymore that if we go through all of these, then we would use the alternate list of names. So hopefully we don't get there but again high likability that we do because of the actual forecast so let's get to that forecast so that we can see it and then we will go through the uh kind of the factors on why we haven't really seen a preseason storm just yet and when we might actually see our first uh our first name storm but speaking of name storms and the forecast an average year contains 14 name storms seven hurricanes and then three of those being major hurricanes so when we say extremely active or hyper active. Here's why. Both Colorado State University and NOAA and several of the other uh, organizations that put out these preseason forecasts, they are all calling for a hyperactive season. 23 named storms from Colorado State University, which is kind of right in the middle of NOAA's range. They always give a range, um, and that would be 17 to 25. 11 hurricanes from Colorado State, 8 to 13 from NOAA five major hurricanes and four to seven of those uh, for NOAA. That's, I mean, that is, uh, they said it, both of them, this is the highest forecast that they have ever issued. Yeah. And I was actually speaking with um, one of the research um, team members there for Colorado State, Dr. Levi Silvers, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and just kind of interested to go into sort of the, you know, deep into the weeds as to why, you know, this forecast uh, was so active. And, you know, um, th this, they said this was their highest forecast total that they ever issued in the month of April. They'll, of course, issue updates throughout the course of the season. Um, but there are some key factors at play uh, this year, and they're con compare they look at where the Atlantic Basin is now, and they compare it to some other notable years. And based off of what they're seeing, two of the years that really caught my eye was uh, that right now conditions are similar to what we had back in 2010 and 2020, which was... Mm. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. That's the yeah. I think a lot of folks would like to forget in many respects, but um, but it was the most active uh, season on record. Uh, that season produced 30 uh, named storms. So um, and you got you have, you're actually have a perfect graphic segue into why one of the big factors that we're we're seeing and look at all that red on the Atlantic Basin. Yeah, record hot temperatures, not just in the Atlantic, but the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico. I did a little breakout segment on this a couple of weeks ago uh, last week. I, couple of weeks ago and uh we I, I looked into how hot it is right now all of the basins are running uh through between th two and a half and three degrees warmer than uh what we should be for this time of year which puts us in record territory the caribbean itself is actually warmer right now than during peak hurricane season uh so we're talking about really really warm water temperatures the gulf of mexico off of clearwater beach hit 90 degrees uh a couple of weeks ago it has come down a little bit but hit 90 degrees already and that was before june 1st so yes very very warm waters out there which we know and if you don't know uh you will find out here on tracking the tropics over the next six months that Warm water temperatures fuel these tropical systems. If they can get going, they feed off of these record warm waters and they will, uh, Rebecca, they will uh, possibly rapidly intensify. They, these storms can grow very, very quickly. Absolutely. And we do have some um, some questions and comments coming in. So I want to remind you, if you just joined, you can use a hashtag to let us see your questions or, use, or your comments. And so if you use the hashtag, hashtag Hey Amanda, hashtag Hey Rebecca, or hashtag Hey Ed, we will be able to see your comments. We'll be able to answer them. And this one goes to Amanda. Tampa's been dodging bullets since I moved here 16 years ago. Could this be our year? It's <laughs> definitely possible, Corey. Yes. Thank you for your uh, question there. 
you know, we've been dodging, a, you know, a bullet like that for 100 years. A lot of people say that we have Indian burial grounds that protect our area, but it's actually true that we have been hit by a major hurricane head on before here in the Tampa Bay area. So uh, we're kind of overdue at this point. And, you know, is it our year? Tough to say if, you know, we'll be hit directly by a storm or not, but we need to be prepared for it because we're going to have plenty of storms to track over the next six months. So we will be prepared for that. But Rebecca, let's start talking about why we haven't seen a preseason storm because we have all these factors there. We have record warm water temperatures. We have La Nina, which we'll talk about here over the next couple of weeks as well. But today we really wanted to talk about why we haven't seen a storm over the past couple of weeks with all of the factors being there, including those warm waters. Yes. And so we've been talking on WFLA all basically three or four weeks now about this heat dome. It's a high pressure or a ridge and it's it's positioned across the center of Mexico. And when you have high pressure of that size and of that power, it really keeps things hot and dry. We saw record heat across Mexico. We saw those stories about the poor sloths dying of heat exhaustion and falling out of the trees. It's basically the opposite of the iguana in the winter in South Florida problem. It was just so incredibly hot over Mexico. And, high, and around a high pressure, air travels clockwise. And so that means we've got really quiet conditions. And across the Gulf, we've got sinking air as well as the, the overall pattern with the air going clockwise around that high pressure system, basically right over the where we typically see storms forming this time of the year. It's robbed the atmosphere from all of that moisture and also the, the potential rotating winds there. So really, until this ridge goes away, we're expecting it to stay quiet. Yeah, and it also, I, I'm sure there's comments coming in, you know, about rainy season for us locally because we haven't seen a lot of rain across our area. This is another reason why our rainy season really hasn't kicked off yet. Uh, we did get some nice downpours yesterday, but again, just a factor leading into why it's been dry, why we have not seen uh, a, a, a tropical system close to home because this time of year, May and June, we do look close to home. This is where typical tropical development happens uh, for the first month of hurricane season. And that is because, Ed, as you know very well, we still have some late season fronts coming in. They can stall out across the area and we can sometimes see quick spin ups of lower end tropical systems forming off those those fronts. But again, we just really haven't seen that this year. Yeah, you're in a normal year. You know, you don't have this historic you know, ridge sitting over Mexico, which is acting as a, a as a suppressing mechanism across the Gulf of Mexico um, in these typically more favored areas. And again, and across even the central Gulf and even here on the northern Gulf Coast, we're starting to get our, our, our water temperatures now climbing into the uh, into the 80s as well. Um, it kind of an interesting fact. Uh, factor here along the northern Gulf Coast, as dry as you all have been down there across the Florida Peninsula, it has been anything but dry along the Gulf Coast as that ridge has kind of been allowing those storm tracks to just kind of ride around the periphery. So we've been getting quite a bit of rain uh, from, this, uh, from these systems in the last uh, couple months. And they've also been fueling a lot of the helping to fuel a lot of those severe weather events, especially those high destructive wind events with just so much instability uh, around the periphery of that of that high. But if you're under that, yeah, you're just not getting a whole lot. And, you know, it's bad for the drought situation in some respects, but I guess you can say on a, on a brighter side, it's helping to suppress the chance of anything tropical trying to develop in these historically uh, more favored regions in the uh, Western Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so, and, you know, still wind shear is still pretty high across the rest of the basin at, at this time. So we're, we're noting some, even the tropical, intertropical convergence zone and some tropical waves and rolling off Africa. But right now, wind shear is just too high, generally speaking. And that's the other big thing, why the Gulf of Mexico, typically on a normal year, you don't have this big ridge in place and you have, Typically, some fairly uh, lower wind shear values across the uh, across the Gulf of Mexico. But again, long as that thing is still in place, there, the chance of anything tropical developing uh, over the short term is pretty low. And Ed, we actually have a, a question and a comment coming in that I think you're probably better posed to answer than me, even though they use the hashtag Hey Rebecca. And remember, use the hashtag Hey Rebecca, hashtag Hey Amanda, or hashtag Hey Ed for us to be able to see your comment, and we can read it here. It says Southeast Louisiana here. We've seen a decline in the temps along our shoreline. In March and April, we had temps of 90 plus, and now the water's in the mid 80s. So Chris Sasser saying that when he would typically see those temperatures going up, he's observed that they've gone down. 
And part of the reason would be here in the last couple of weeks, and you mentioned the last month, it has been incredibly active in the last month along the northern Gulf Coast with these, I mean, we've been seeing all the images of these storm of these storm complexes coming in out of starting in Texas. We saw those destructive wind events over Texas. Well, those have been consistently rolling through the northern Gulf Coast. So you get system after system after system, just not really nearly as much sunshine as we expect over the Gulf Coast uh, this time of the year, as things have been still fairly active along the periphery of that ridge. And that is partially one of the reasons why we did notice that there was a drop in the temps along the Louisiana Gulf Coast. If you go back to March and April, it was very dry. And we get, we were watching some of those uh, historic uh, drought numbers developing earlier this year over Louisiana. But then immediately, and then once it got into April, uh, you know, the season just got so active and we didn't have uh, we had more rain and a lot more rain across uh, parts of uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Northwest Florida. And so that's part of the reason why I've been seeing those uh, those water temperatures kind of holding, you know, closer average right along the immediate coast. But I, I, I caution folks there, once you go about, you know, 50, 60 miles off the coast, get into the central Gulf, those water temperatures are running quite hot. So it's although the immediate coastline has been seeing a little bit of a reprieve from that, the central Gulf, it's not a, it's not the same story. And that leads us perfectly into our next question, which we're going to send towards Amanda, because between her meteorology expertise and her fishing and diving, <laughs> no one is more perfect to answer this question. How deep does hot or warm water go in the water offshore? Yeah, so that's a great question. Right now, we're building that depth at the moment. So I'll put in our... Um, I'm going to pull up this graphic right here, which uh, is a look at our ocean heat content and how far those warm waters go down depths wise. So you have the surface water temperatures, which is uh, where we get a lot of those sensors from. If we say the water temperature is 90 degrees, that's usually at the surface. But then at the farther you go down, it gets a little bit cooler, less sunlight. Right. So the water temperatures go down. But you can see in the Caribbean where that purple is. That means that water, that warm water extends extremely far down. And that's where those tropical systems can come in and really take up uh, the energy. Because if a tropical system comes in, you know, it's and there's the, that water depth isn't uh, that water temperature isn't warm enough, far enough down. Well, it turns up the surface of the waters and it cools it off pretty quickly. But if it can turn up the surface of the waters and the waters are still warm, it can continue to feed off of those warm waters and at the end of the day get stronger now in the gulf of mexico obviously you can see the the shades get a lot lighter there so we're not seeing those depths be super warm just yet but you could the arrows that you see kind of uh, moving from the Caribbean up through the Gulf of Mexico, that's what we call the loop current. And that is already very warm, very far down. So we're only going to see this map expand as we go through the next couple of months, especially, Ed, if we don't see a, an early season storm here in June and July. We kind of like to see those sometimes because it does tend to churn up the waters a little bit, keep them a little bit cooler, a little bit longer, gives us a nice break from the, you know, the drought if we we need it like we do here in Tampa. We have been under the heat dome. Um, unlike you guys, you guys have been seeing those storm systems roll through. So we kind of like to see an early season storm kind of come in, at least an excess, a surge of tropical moisture move over us, which is possible late next week. We'll keep an eye on it. Some of the longer range forecast models are showing that kind of moving across the peninsula of Florida, at least some tropical moisture, not necessarily anything organized at this point. Uh, if it does, we'll alert you here on tracking the tropics. But right now, to answer your question, in the ma majority of the Gulf of Mexico, the, the waters aren't super warm, super far down just yet. But the loop current, where a lot of these storms kind of uh, end up rapidly intensifying, we are starting to see that, that um, increase depth of the warmth. I have a question for Ed, and this comes from a segment that Chief Meteorologist here at WFLA did last week. Um, he found out that they name eddies when they become particularly large or, or they are um, part of the, the factors that might uh, go into what huh. them predicting weather. And they, they have a sense of humor. Uh, they named the, the eddy that's out there right now from the loop current that they're tracking. They named it Eddie Malone, who's one of their <laughs> forecasters, but spelled at you know the traditional <laughs> name way. And nice. so I didn't know if you knew that they named eddies, particularly different ed names, and if you were going to try to throw your name in the hat. 
<laughs> I, I I did not uh, know that they uh, they named the Eddies, but I do remember like on our introductory meteorology classes when all, we were all in, in college and we had to start talking, you know, uh, the topic of Eddies. And then once it comes in, you get about half the room that just turns their head and just looks at the one person named Eddie in the class. <laughs> and that was you. <laughs> that, that was me. That was me. Yeah. But, it, you know, it, it's it, it's amazing. I think this is a good, I, good time to kind of mention that. A lot of folks, um, you know, when we talk about these these uh, tropical forecasting and and whether certain storms are going to rapidly intensify, I don't think a lot of folks really understand everything that has to come together for to actually even just develop a tropical system. Like you just did a great explanation with this uh, ocean heat content, and it's you know it's not just warm water; it's it's the depth of the water. It's the it's the um, it's the wind shear. It's the moisture. It, there are so many factors. You really need to, in truth be told, I think uh, to actually get an act a tropical wave or to try actually develop, it's it's actually more difficult than a lot of folks realize. The majority of tropical waves across the Atlantic Basin will not develop. The vast majority, and we get tropical waves throughout the year. The most of them just will not develop. And so you need a lot of factors, including the deep uh, um, warm water to uh, to to get these tropical systems uh, to form. I'm glad, you know, tracking the tropics gives us a great opportunity to ex try to explain this and and dive a little bit deeper into the weeds to explain to folks that although forecasting has come a long way and we all know we know with the um, data that we have readily available to us, even just during our newscasts, it's come a long way. But. There is a there's still a high degree of uncertainty when these systems you know start to develop, how fast they're moving, how organized are they now? What's the upper level environment like? So um so tropical forecasting is hard. It's not as easy, I think that that folks um uh, uh, think it is. Uh, so that's why I'm glad we have an opportunity to on this uh, and a platform here to to explain a lot of that to all of our viewers. I certainly love it as well, Ed. Uh, you know, again, I think we're we're 25 minutes in at this point. It doesn't feel like it because, <laughs> no. you know, we just like to nerd out. We like to answer your questions. We like to be here for and provide you this information throughout the season. One thing I think that we will uh, end up with as we go through this first episode of tracking the tropics for the 2024 season is this map right here. So we are likely going to see an active season or a hyperactive season. We're going to see a lot of name storms this year. That doesn't say that all of, you know, that's not to say that all of those storms are going to make landfall somewhere. Hopefully most of them will stay fish storms. But as we get toward the peak of hurricane season, we will obviously be watching those storms a little bit closer. We're going to have a lot more of that ocean heat content available for these storms to feed off of. But just so you know, folks, June and July, we do tend to see a few storms here and there, but the real active months come August, September, October. That's when we see a little bit uh, more of those ingredients come together uh, for these tropical waves to take advantage of, and, and more of them will likely do uh, develop. But we're at, you know, basically June 1. It's mm -hmm. June 4 at the moment, uh, but we've got six months ahead of us, so we're going to be here every single step of the way. Uh, if, you, if you ever have a question that you want us to cover, please send it our way. Uh, we will definitely cover it here on tracking the tropics, whether that's a topic or we just answer it as a question if you uh, have it in the in the comments section. But I think we are going to wrap up our official first episode of the 2024 season. I want to send a huge thank you to WKRG Chief Meteorologist Ed Bloodsworth there. Uh, definitely a familiar face here on the program. We always love having you and, and you know, having your expertise uh, as a meteorologist along the Gulf Coast. Obviously, you've covered hurricanes here in Tampa. You have covered hurricanes there uh, uh, in Mobile as well. So I'm sure we'll be seeing you again this season. Absolutely. And folks, make sure you get prepared now, whether it's going to be a an active season or or maybe it turns out not to be as active as predicted. Make sure you start preparing now, get your supplies together and, uh, and uh, make sure you have everything ready to go in case you need to uh, take action um, should you need to evacuate or if a storm rolls your way. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, several folks will have to put those plans into place this year. We are going to be here when that happens on tracking the tropics. Uh, but uh, to your point, Ed, right now in Florida, at least it is the disaster preparedness tax free holiday. It goes through next weekend, I believe. So make sure you take advantage of that for sure. Uh, Rebecca, as always, thank you for being here and answering our questions uh, and being a familiar face on tracking the tropics. Thank you. Thank you. It's my the most fun part of hurricane season because 
the rest of it's not that much fun. And one of my favorite <laughs> things to do with Rebecca, uh, she has these hurricane hacks, and we will be going through those at some point over the next couple of months during a quiet week. Uh, you will not want to miss those. There are some pretty good ones, including uh, a quarter and a cup. <laughs> yes, a quarter and a cup. The, the things that sell out before a hurricane that aren't on any hurricane preparation lists that you're probably going to need at least one or two of. And we also got a last minute question that leads us into oh. what we're probably going to talk okay. about next week. So I was going to let you it. tease ahead to next week. Sam asking, does El Nino have any effect on the hurricane season? <laughs> it absolutely does. El Nino, La Nina, we uh, have been talking about both of them over the past 12 months uh, because we've seen, a uh, we've seen a switch back and forth. The other side of this record hot uh, temperature map that we showed you just a few minutes ago was that La Nina is forming. It's not officially in place just yet, but it is going to have a big effect on why we could see a hyperactive season. Next week, we're going to cover uh, a lot more in detail of, of these specific factors, these record hot water temperatures, La Nina forming, the Saharan dust. We're going to go into specifically what that does for us going through the next six months. For now, we are lucky and happy to say that the tropics are quiet. No new activity is expected to develop over the next seven days. And we got another last minute comment. Okay. I think you're going to want to read. Hashtag, hey, Amanda, thank you for your coverage. Y'all nailed it during Ian with your 24-hour coverage. Much preferred it over a different weather avenue. <laughs> <laughs> Darlene, thank you for that comment. I wasn't going to mention it at the beginning of the stream here, but this is an Emmy win Emmy winning platform. So, you know, we, we, we do take pride in our work. We take pride in not overhyping anything and giving you the straight facts. We break down the forecasts with you. We go over those forecast models and we answer your questions. We're here uh, and we are here, you know, every week on Tuesdays, but we're here when storms hit as well, because that is when it actually matters. So that's a, uh, you know, I take pride in, in yeah. when we are on live during storms because, you know, that's when people are tuned in and they are asking those questions. What's it, what's happening at my house? Yeah. What ha What's happening at my family's house as well? And I'll add just one little quick thing here. And it's something I've heard from all of our emergency managers um, here as we've been kind of getting our, ourselves set for the active season is, you know, it's one of the big emphasis they put on is, you know, trust your, trust your local people. They're the ones who live in your communities. They're the ones who, you know, they, they're, they're taxpayers in your communities. They are just as invested as keeping uh, your communities informed as um, as anyone. So um, and so, again, this uh, tracking the tropics gives us a great opportunity to do that as we bring in all of these uh, local meds from around uh, next our nation here. So it's a great chance. Make sure you're paying attention to the right sources of, uh, of your local media um, to make sure you're getting the best information for your community should a storm threaten. Yeah, I've been preaching that a lot this over the this season over the past couple of months. Ed is follow your local meteorologist because we know for our area how a storm is going to impact us geographically. We're very familiar, so whether uh, it be a different angle that the storm is approaching us from, or we're in a different quadrant of the storm, we're going to be able to tell you exactly what's going to happen county by county, city by city uh, when these storms are approaching us. So following your local meteorologist, following your local National Weather Service meteorologist office is incredibly important. Because because a lot of times you'll just get a generic forecast. You'll see the cone, you know, posted on social media, hope, hoping that it's the latest cone because, you know, social media doesn't put everything in chronological order. So follow your local meteorologist. We are going to break it down impact uh, county by county. I've been preaching that a lot over the past couple of months. Yep. The, uh, you know, good folks on, on national on the national media, we, we know a lot of them. We enjoy them, but they... A lot of them will not be able to tell you when the Gandhi when the Gandhi is going to flood, or when Bayshore is going to flood, or up here when the Mobile River or the I-10 Bayway and Causeway will go underwater. We can do that for you. We are we are your local meds, so make sure you you trust your uh, your local uh, meteorologist and your local emergency officials. And we are here to do that over the next six months on tracking the tropics. Uh, if you have joined us over the past six, uh, over the past five season, this, this is our sixth season now. Thank you for coming back. We're going to be here again this season. If you're new here, welcome. We are excited to have you. Uh, and we're going to be, I think, here, on here a lot over the next six months. So I think that's going to do it for our first episode this season. We will be live again next Tuesday right here on this app, on this uh, social media page, wherever you're watching from, we will be 
live again next Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. So set your alarms week to week. We're going to be here and we will be answering your questions and tracking every single storm that does develop. Thank you, Ed, for joining me. Thank you, of course, Rebecca, for joining as well. Until then, we'll be we'll be right back. Find Tracking the Tropics on these platforms. And for storm updates, the latest models, and helpful resources, visit trackingthetropics.tv.